All right, guys. Hope you guys are doing well. Check out this foil. Urza's Destiny. Uncut sheet. That's right. A Texas foil guy's cradle. This entire sheet I acquired recently. I have this and other items for sale. Just contact me. The link is below. Call me or text me at 206-914-7974. I have lots of eBay auctions going on right now. If you're looking for other rarities, just hit me up. Or if you're selling, I'm paying cash. Hope you guys have a great day, and I hope you guys enjoy the video. Hey everyone, it's me, Daniel, with VintageMagic.com, and welcome back. All right, so today we are talking about Holy Grails, Grails, your dream card. What are they? Let's talk about it, and how can you acquire them? All right, so these cards here are on eBay auction or we have them available. Please contact us uh, below. My number is below my email, so you can hit me up if you're looking for the high-end stuff, such as the original Black Lotus painting I sold for $4 million in 2022. I can help you uh, look for something like that. If you're looking for a lower-end piece, more like a Power 9, an Alpha card, maybe a revised dual end, I can help you with that also. So hit me up, my contacts below. All right, so what is a grail? Because a lot of people like use grail like it's, like, like anything's a grail. Like really, anything's a grail. And I almost feel like people overuse that term in the sense that they see someone post, oh man, there's an awesome power nine there or awesome artwork. I'm just, that, that's my grail. I, I, I just have to have that thing. And I think... What people are trying to say is that a grail is, you know, and by the way, I want to hear in the comments below if you feel differently, but a grail to me is something that has significant sentimental value that has uh, kind of the ultimate prize if I was collecting something. And then if I was to be able to acquire the grail, uh, this is what I would go after, right? This is the number one thing I could think of that I would get. So that's my definition. Feel free to you know debate me below. I love to hear more about it. I love the comments. My favorite parts of the videos is to talk to you guys in the comments. All right. So some people have told me, well, Grail Stan are also just dream cards, dream things that I I I'm hoping I can get one day. It's the uh, you know you know I'm gonna save up one day to get it. Uh, you know, it's like my dream house, as they call it in the house world, right? Okay. Fair enough, I can see that also. But what does it take to purchase these cards? Because everybody asks me, like, Dan, you sell these high-end cards, collectibles, uh, you know, like original artwork for the Black Lotus sold for $4 million in 2022. That's the highest sale of any uh, magic art or collectible ever known. Uh, it ranks amongst the, the, some of the top collectibles in the sports card and Pokemon and other collectible history. So. Who even buys this stuff? How, how are people even able to acquire it? Well, the first step, guys, is to contact me if you have any questions. That's the first step. You, you know, if you want to contact anybody, that's fine, but contact me. I would love to hear from you guys. I want to help you guys in the journey of finding your grail, and that's important to me because I've honestly found a lot of grails or sold a lot of grails or brokered a lot of grails and I mean, I'm using the grail word a lot, but I'm going to just use it like crazy today. Um, it, it, it really, the best part, and I mean this sincerely, is seeing people, you know, hold their grail, hold their prize card, their, the dream item, and they're just like in complete utter awe, right? Literally like, wow, like this is like incredible. And some, of, some people actually tear up. They get very emotional about it. And to this day, I know people that still have their grails or their collectible cards, and they still look at them either on the wall, they would either uh, you know, uh, get them framed up, etc., and it gets them all emotional and excited. And I think it doesn't have to be the most expensive item. That I wanna be clear. When I talk about like these higher end items, it's kind of giving you a range, right? But to some people, it could just be some unlimited power. Unlimited power is very accessible to people. You know, we have stuff on eBay auction. We have stuff available coming all the time for unlimited power. Um, but it, 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 it's not necessarily the highest priced item, right? 
Um, some people can only afford revised cards. Uh, some people can afford fourth edition, you know, etc. I mean, you could call that your grail if that's something that you're striving for. I don't, I don't insult or ever uh, discount people's, you know, kind of passion for collecting. I, I really feel like people don't, you know, there's like debates about, well, your grail doesn't seem really that big of a grail. Like it's just dumb. It's almost like saying, hey, you know, like my, you know, I really like my old Ford Mustang, probably worth let's say of ten thousand dollars. You know, I'm not saying I have, I'm not saying I have one, but I'm saying I'm making an example of, and. Yeah, I, I love my Ford Mass Mustang. It's not worth a lot, but I love it. And that's my grail. I love it. And I'm thinking to myself, that's pretty fucking awesome. Because that's something that you really worked hard for or you had a passion for. Your grandpa or your father may have you know, had one before and you were able to buy one. And remember, maybe it was passed down and that's your grail now. That's fine. That's all that matters. So... Everybody has their own grail. I want to hear in the comments below, what are your grails? What are your favorite uh, cards that you either have or you wish you had? Now, acquiring the collectibles is another question, and I'm going to start answering this now. It takes a certain amount of uh, finding, right? We're, you know, we, after you talk to someone like myself or a, a, a collector or whoever, right? You can search for the grail. You find the grail. It's going to take, you know, a couple things. One, the collector may not want to actually sell the grail. Uh, so what that means is a lot of grails are already in collections that are really advanced, really large, and they, people that really don't need money. They don't want to sell their collectibles. So convincing them to sell their grail or their investment or whatever is one of the most difficult parts to the whole thing. And that's why having like a broker or a person like myself, whatever, to help negotiate or kind of get that conversation going, it, it, it really is uh, a lot easier from what I've seen. And I've seen this from other industries. Like, you know, as much as I would like to, um, you know, like negotiate homes or cars or other, you know, collectibles that I love, right? I actually go to other professionals who are experts in the art industry or whatever, right? Something that I'm interested in, I go to them and I rely on them to give me information and facts so I can make that right decision to purchase grails for myself, right? Collectibles for myself. So I advise you guys to talk to an expert, talk to someone that knows what they're talking about, who has reputation of selling and collecting and investing and has always been you know, in that forefront in the beginning. That's, that's very important. Because your time is valuable. I think time is so valuable when it comes to these finding the grails and also negotiating the grails. All right, so we've kind of talked about, you know, getting to this point, you're ready to per possibly purchase the grail. Now, obviously it comes down to money. I mean, money is what makes the, the collectible world you know, run. If you have the money in the end and you have the money to show that you are willing to purchase it at a very strong above market price, you're probably going to be able to achieve that grail very quickly. Now, a lot of you have expressed to me, this is very normal, and don't be offended by it, is that people have said, you know, Dan, I want to get, I, I want to purchase something, I want to purchase my grail, but I don't want to overpay, or I don't want to um, uh, get ripped off, or I don't want to be, you know, you know, whatever, right? I want to make sure that, you know, I want to make sure I get a fair deal. Okay, and that is a valid thing. I, as a collector, have experienced that my entire life, right? And me, you know, I, I totally get it. But I will, I will say one thing, is that if you really want something that someone else has and they don't want to sell it, you're probably going to have to pay more than what you think it's worth. And it's really what the person selling it wants to sell it for. And otherwise, you go in a situation where there might be an auction. Auction sometimes has grails. Like the original Force of Will uh, art that sold on Heritage for $350,000. That, to some people, is a grail. Uh, it's one of the most iconic paintings in the world for Magic the Gathering. It's a blue card, the most famous counterspell, uh, easily. Uh, it's just a, an awesome piece of history. But is that your grail? And if it was, you would have to had bid on that item at that moment in time, you would have to have known about it and you would have to have all the funds ready to go and pay it within the time period that they required. So that to me is 
a challenging part when it comes to grails. Sometimes you have to sell off your collection, you have to trade, etc. You have to get money and funds ready to go to purchase an item. So, grails are really challenging sometimes to actually achieve by a lot of different reasons, like I mentioned. But when I say that you have to pay more, I mean that. You know, you might be in a bidding war, but in the case of most private sales, you're going to have to put a price up that the seller wants. And what does that mean? What is a premium that a seller would take? Uh, that takes some negotiation. I think that this is why a broker, a, a person that discuss, you know, kind of works between the buyer and the seller, right? Yourself, if you're the buyer and the seller, and they, they negotiate, hey, hey, you know, I have a client who wants to purchase this item. Uh, that's the first step is having it available for your purchase. And then you are going to then work with the broker myself, let's say, and try to get a deal you know, done and also not pay the most money, right? But you want to pay enough money where, you know, the, the seller is interested in selling. So this, I think, is the true talent is trying to see, you know, once you have something available, how are you able to negotiate it and get to a point where it's not insanely high, but to a point where the seller feels like it's a great price, right? This is something that and I'm not here to talk about negotiation techniques today, but I think that that's you know, a key component to the whole process. All right, so let's say you strike the deal and you want, you then concern about a very important issue is authenticity. Authenticity is by far one of the most important components to grading of cards. Uh, that's why they have PSA, CGC, and Beckett as the main ones. And SGC in some some cases for sports cards and then you also have artwork right artwork artist proof stuff like that you know that they have a you know you have people that are experts in that field I've sold a lot of artwork I've invested a lot of artist proofs I can help you with the appraisal process of that you know grail search so it, it's kind of like you kind of have to have that though up in the front it, you don't want to just find something negotiate with someone and then find out that the item is just fake anyway. I mean, and then I've had instances that people have attempted to do this themselves and they go off and find like a beta booster box or they find an unlimited booster box or unlimited starter deck pack or I don't know, whatever, right? It doesn't matter what it is, alpha starter. And the item is searched, it's uh, resealed, uh, the card's fake, uh, the artwork, you know, was, I don't know, just made up, it was a digital thing and you know the guy just wanted to scam people's money there are so many fraudulent crap stories out there that's another reason why I implore you to I, I, I just so beg you to use a broker who knows what they're doing because they their responsibility is for you as the buyer especially in the buyer sense to find and the right items in the right authenticity and Condition. That's another thing. Why do people buy all these graded cards? The guy who bought the three million dollar uh, CGC pristine uh, uh, Black Lotus, and he paid three million dollars. Why would he pay that? I mean, for him, he, you know, that guy, you know, I think he's on Instagram. He was very uh, interested in uh, creating a, a, a quality uniform set, but he also wanted to. Uh, you know, he also sees the value in the, the grades, the quality. And it's very hard to get incredibly great, uh, strong, uh, strong overall grades with, you know, great centering corners and edges surface for these old alpha cards, right? So to some people, the, the marquee of having these quality cards, you have the history, but you have the quality and then, you know, the authentication, all that plays in the play of why the prices just balloon, right? They have cases of artwork, you know, like the Black Lotus painting, or in the case of like Mox Sapphire, I own the original painting for that. You know, Time Walk, I have that original also. Um, these paintings are just so iconic in the world of magic. The price is very challenging. How do you price that? You know, the, the reality is, what is the seller wanting and what are you willing to pay? Or if, if the seller is asking something that you don't think is worth it, you might have to pay a, you know, maybe a 10 to 20, 30, maybe a 50% premium. I don't know, right? 
But if you really want that grail, that's the way it works in art business or collectability. Same thing with real estate or fancy cars or wine or you know anything, anything in this world. If you're doing an auction, it doesn't matter. You have to overpay, overbid uh, asking prices and estimated value prices all the time. So I, I wouldn't use any of like the past history. It doesn't matter what someone paid for the item back in the day or whatever, even like a month ago in some cases, right? Things could go up because of demand, you know, whatever. I would, you know, focus more on how much do you really love it? How much do you really want it? Can you financially afford it? And then go after that uh, based on the availability and make a strong offer if it ever gets to a point. And obvious, it, obviously, use a broker when possible who has the reputation to get it done. And that's very important. Last part is the delivery. Okay, so delivery of grails is one of the most important parts of the whole piece. I think white glove delivery, and I don't mean by wearing a white glove and delivering it. That's just Jeff Bosky comment he made to me years ago, where he was like, where's this white glove that you keep, are supposed to be using to deliver the carts? And I, uh, I think that was kind of funny when, uh, you know, years ago I met Jeff. I will tell you that most delivery is just, you know, over dinner, drinks, uh, to the, the buyer's uh, location and uh, were they residents or you know whatnot or a hotel and you just deliver the card and maybe they do a video maybe they don't and they're just so happy they have the item and as you've seen on you know like TikTok or uh, YouTube videos etc you see all these other collectors big name ones in sports card world the gray the the grail at uh, the feeling is tremendous people uh, have the sense of like wow like of a, kind of a rush of dopamine and nostalgia. Um, it's kind of like me and seeing some of these Marvel uh, comics, uh, masterpieces, artwork that I love. I love Julie Bell and Boris Vallejo art from 1996 Marvel Masterpieces. I really like um, the Joe Jusco art from Marvel also. Uh, and for Magic, I really love the artist proofs. I think the artist proofs are near and dear to me in the sense that there was a history of time where I recognize how long it took to get the art uh, done on the back of the card, to find the proof, to get the journey, to then you know put them in you know collect them and then sleep them up and just look at them and you know sometimes I'm just you know having a down day or you know just like kind of reminiscing about what I've done in Magic and I look at some of the cards and be like I remember I went to that convention, I remember when I met Mark Poole or I met Dan Frazier or you know whatever like I had that card altered then and it took me years to get it back then. I remember that show where that artist, you know, had that piece of art that wasn't really magic and it was just a cool piece and it, you know, maybe he has it available. I like to purchase that. It's it just invokes this really cool like I mean that's the that's the best part. The best part of grails is the journey that you go to f actually get to the grail. Not just buying like a lot of people have money, but it's the finding of the grail, the whole you know, getting it, you know, you know what I mean? It's just that, do you relate? I mean, I'm just trying to be as real as possible. So, all right, guys. Well, thank you guys for listening to me on this one. Uh, it, you know, it's not a sales pitch. I'm going to be honest. Like, if you guys can find any other broker or dealer you wish, but, you know, I've had, obviously, incredible amount of experience. Just look at the stuff I sell on eBay, uh, but I've sold every single valuable magic art, cards, uh, high-end graded cards, whatever. I mean, I've helped with multi-million dollar collections. I flew all over the world sometimes. I probably tell you stories sometimes where I had to pick up something uh, from one country, fly the same time, and go to another country, all within that same you know multi-day span. And I didn't even go home. I just lived out of a suitcase to do the grail, the grail delivery, purchase and delivery. Right. So I have the experience. But I, whatever you do, whatever you choose, I want you to remember: have fun with the whole process. Uh, Comment below. Tell me your grails. Tell me what you want to get. If you have any questions, let me know. And I uh, appreciate you guys listening. All right, guys. Take care. Have a good one. Vintage Magic. Game. Collect. Invest. For more information about our consulting and professional services, visit VintageMagic.com. Hey everyone, it's me, Daniel, with VintageMagic.com. I want to share with you more about how we handle consignments. 
So to begin the consignment process, we actually need to start with the consultation service. In this consultation, I will determine what you're looking to do. And generally consigners usually tell me, hey Dan, I'm looking to sell my items and maximize the value of their collection. After we determine through the consultation, I usually like to do an appraisal process. And an appraisal process in terms of a consignment is more fitted towards authenticity and valuation for current market values. From there, after a contract is crafted and signed, we will then receive the items from you. The reason why our consignment process is very thorough is we also identify cards that could be graded so then they can maximize higher dollar values. So the payment process is very simple. Once we have sold your items, you'll get an updated ledger and we will process payment um, for whatever form of payment you need. As a consigner, you're gonna experience our white glove service. What that means is I'm gonna personally handle your collectibles from beginning to end. And rest assured, the client that purchases your collectibles will also receive the same white glove service. It's a signature service that I really pride myself on in working closely with my clients. Vintage Magic. Game. Collect. Invest. For more information about our consulting and professional services, visit VintageMagic.com.